A major attraction this year will be the Sydney-Newcastle-Sydney Yacht Race. 60 vessels are expected in the challenge with a planned overnight stop in Newcastle. With no permanent berthing facilities, the Maritime Services Board has solved the problem. We intend to install a portable marina facility. Uh, the area where it will be installed is down at number 5 Lee Wharf. Uh, the plan of the facility in more detail is shown here. Uh, it will consist of three units extending out into the stream from the wharf. Uh, these fully articulated pontoon units are anchored in position. Access is via ramp from Fired Lee. And we hope that we can accommodate 60 or more yachts at this facility. The yachts will not in fact lie alongside this facility. They'll put their anchors down and tie up their sterns to the facility. Uh, going to be a very impressive sight. According to Harbour Master Captain Morrison, right. the floating Adjacent marina the will be trucked to Newcastle highway. from Sydney. Newcastle Harbour has only limited accommodation for visiting vessels. However, the Waterways Division of the Maritime Services Board and the Newcastle City Council are now looking into the possibility of building a permanent marina. Whether or not a decision is uh, made to go ahead with the provision of such a facility is, uh, is not known. Uh, my main concern, of course, is the commercial side of the operation here, and therefore it's not really my province. Uh, uh, I'm sure we'd all welcome the provision of that sort of facility. About 10 square kilometres of bushland in the Brisbane Waters National Park west of Gosford has been completely destroyed by fire in the last few days. Last night it was burning on a new and particularly dangerous front near Mullet Creek on the Hawkesbury River. Fire officials believe this front was deliberately lit near the railway line in very steep and rugged terrain. In no time at all it had run to the top of the ridge and was posing a threat to cottages that line the water's edge and are nestled in the bushland. Today a helicopter kept up water bombing in the area while ground crews worked tirelessly on the control perimeter. This has ensured that houses are safe from any threatening wind change. Fire control officers hope to have the fire out later tonight. Reserve members are sometimes called cut lunch commandos, but today at least one unit was out and about spreading the word that they are not to be taken lightly. The 113 Field Battery Artillery Unit is looking for gunners and drivers. They emphasise that it's not only great experience, but you also get paid, and unemployed people don't lose any benefits. Nevertheless, the unit is not finding it easy recruiting new people. No one seems to be all that interested these days. Rather stick to the beaches, that sort of thing, rather than get out and earn some honest money. Nearby, a number of young men who are precisely the age that the reserve is looking for were engrossed in a video game and did not think much of the Army Reserve's campaign. I wouldn't really be boring, but like, it's just too much of a commitment, I think. <laughs> Twenty years ago, Peter Cockbain started Raylec Engineering in a tin shed with a dirt floor to fill a gap he saw in the electrical engineering marketplace. Now he's director of a company which employs 120 people and is set for further expansion. The company builds transportable power substations like this one bound for a mine in New Guinea. 
The Big Bell gold mine contract calls for a similar unit, but much larger, and the company has 16 weeks to complete the job and transport it 4,000 kilometres. The unit itself is quite large. It's 20 metres long, 4 metres wide and 3 metres high and weighs about 50 tonne and it incorporates a 23 panel 11,000 volt switch gear. Uh, the logistics of manufacturing and designing that unit and transporting it to 4,000 kilometres to site and then putting it 3 metres in the air on structure which we are also to design makes it quite a challenge and about a third larger than any other unit we've manufactured to date. According to Mr Cockbane, much of the company's success is owed to its persistence in pursuing contracts, as well as a growing appreciation of the region's heavy engineering and technical expertise. I've no doubt about that. The fact that we've uh, had repeat orders from uh, Bougainville, uh, Octetti, and many of the large mining companies and industrial operations makes it quite obvious that the acceptance of our workmanship and our design is as good as anywhere else that they've been able to purchase anywhere in the world. Council's worries started here when a fire inspection revealed serious safety problems preventing the hall's use for children's services. The report listed doors, wall cladding and kitchen facilities as being unacceptable for playgroup activities. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Council has about 30 halls in similar condition being used by about a dozen playgroups. A meeting this morning assured Council that the halls were still this safe this for adult use. Well, they comply with the Theatre and Public Halls Act and they still all comply with that act. They simply don't comply with the Board of Fire Commissioner's requirements insofar as use by children is concerned. This means that playgroup activities will have to find other accommodation in senior citizens' halls or private clubs. Upgrading Nord's Wharf Community Centre would cost over $15,000, far more than the building is worth. Others would cost up to $80,000, which is far more than council could afford especially for the small number of ratepayers requiring playgroup services. Council will hold a review of all halls in Ward 1 next week to find out exactly which groups are affected and what alternatives, if any, exist. officially opened the housing department's half million dollar office on Derby Street this morning. 23 staff members will provide a full range of government housing services in a centralised location described by the Minister as a one-stop shop for all private and public housing, rental and purchase requirements. Mr Walker also announced a major home and land package deal offering 300 new family homes at prices from $39,000 to $185,000 plus land from the end of this month. The scheme, dubbed the Super Sale, is the single biggest housing allocation in the state, allowing home buyers to secure uh, a house, land and finance package for an outlay of just $1,000. Uh, Jennings and Westpac have made considerable sacrifices in their profits to provide $1,000 deposit loans, which is the best deal in Australia, and the people should be running to get them. Now it is a very attractive deal. Is there a risk of, of people getting into, uh, into financial difficulties? The sorts of loans that we have are protected against that. Uh, if you become unemployed or sick, automatically your repayments go down to your, your, the benefits you receive as a, uh, either as an unemployed person or as an ill person and uh, when you get a job again it goes back up again so our loans are protected from that sort of problem. Building sites are available in all Hunter Housing Commission regions and the home land packages are available with a guarantee of no rise in cost providing the purchaser is ready to proceed within three months. a special get-together for the prisoners of war who served side-by-side side building the Burma Railway. The local veterans belonged to the Air Force that began work on the line halfway between Thailand and Burma. 
Captain Roy Mills enlisted with the field ambulance unit and was appointed as the medical officer to the first train by the troops to go from Changi prison camp to Thailand. His offsider was orderly George Beecham. Together they helped to keep alive the prisoners who worked a 16-hour day in treacherous conditions. Well, we had hardly any medical supplies. We had to improvise as best we could what was available locally, which is like uh, red palm oil, we might get some sulphur, mix the red palm oil to treat scabies and skin diseases. Uh, tropical ulcers, we had a little bit of lice hole which we used to treat the ulcers with. George would Dr Mills kept a diary from, of the uh, gruelling eight months he spent in 1943. It mysteriously vanished but up. returned only a few weeks ago. It's a, a daily record of events with a lot of gaps in it because at times it was too dangerous to keep a diary. So that, uh, uh, as I mentioned to you, it had been posted by registered post to the officer nominated after we got home. And then when the war historian wrote to me, I referred to my diary, but they could never find it and it's been lost for over 40 years. The coaching clinics cater for cricketers between the ages of 9 and 15. The youngsters are refining their skills to ensure they give their best in Junior Cricket Association fixtures and other club competitions when they resume in February. Their coaches are Newcastle rep player Robert Dan, former Newcastle rep player Ron Campbell, Southern Lakes all-rounder Mark Jones and ex Walls End cricketer Paul Wright. Former Sheffield Shield cricketer Kerry Thompson is organising the clinic. Running between wickets uh, seems to be uh, a, a definite deficiency area for, for young children just in terms of their communication. So we do spend a, a, a quite an amount of time in terms of getting some understanding between the, the team runners. In fact, uh, if you look at even test level, some of, uh, some of the running between wickets is uh, a little bit ordinary. The Time for Truth Awareness Group say they represent about 3,000 Aboriginal people living in the Newcastle district and their tent embassy will make sure those people aren't overlooked during Newcastle's bicentennial festivities. Organisers say they are aware that they're trespassing, but they say protesters plan to make a statement that is peaceful and well behaved. So if we're told to leave, we, we most probably will leave. What we, The reason we've chosen and we've set up here is basically um, some 200 years ago, Captain Cook was supposed to sign a treaty with the Aboriginal peoples of this land. He didn't do so. So um, I suppose, in essence, we, we still really uh, have the right to set up here, and uh, we've taken that, that role. hasn't been cursed with the bad frost and hail damage of some of Australia's other premium wine growing areas, there has been an overabundance of rain. Any more and fungal growths could become a problem, but today's sunshine lightened the hearts of vignerons, none the least of which was Wyndham's Brian McGuigan. At the moment uh, there's a lot of uh, fruit on the vine so in terms of quantity it looks very good and if we can have this nice sunny weather that we've had yesterday and today for the next uh, 10 or 12 days we'll be all very happy about the quality of fruit that we're going to produce this year. Well, it of the Wyndham Empire that necessitates a start nearly a week earlier than last year. Other producers plan to start harvesting early next month. With all in readiness, how does Brian McGuigan rate the prospects for this year's quality? If we have dry conditions, if you're working on a scale, say, from 1 to 10, I would say right now 1 would eight, uh, rate at about 8.5, something in that area. Uh, but uh, uh, it's in God's hands right now. Um, things could change very quickly. How does your 8.5 rate historically? 
Um, uh, above average. Above average. I would say since 1980, uh, we've had some extremely good vintages, and on the average, there'd be around about an eight. We're a bit over that now, I think, because of the, the, the quantity of fruit that you see on the vines. As much as 20,000 tonnes of grapes could be picked in the Hunter by mid-March, translating into 1.3 million dozen bottles of premium wine. With national statistics pointing to a reduction in consumption, but a turn to higher quality wine, and the Australian dollar halving the price effectively of our wines overseas, the region could be heading for a record $130 million in retail sales. summer school at the Jesse Brownlee Ballet Academy. It's an opportunity for students to keep up their fitness levels over the vacation as well as learning new skills. Ballet teacher Leanne Lynch, who's danced professionally overseas and with the Australian Ballet, is teaching along with her mother Elaine Morgan, who's an examiner at the Royal Academy of Dancing. The students are being taught a new syllabus from the Royal Academy of Dancing in London and a number of Newcastle Ballet teachers are sitting in to pick up tips from the masters. Leanne Lynch says injury prevention is a particular focus of the school. And through my own experience of being injured over many years of dancing, I have learnt to put together my own syllabus of exercises and uh, advice on nutrition, ways to take care of the body, and the children are finding this a great help, and really it's, it's not been taught anywhere else, and uh, it's extremely necessary, particularly when they get into a professional company, that they know how to take care of themselves. Alco Steel's achievement of breaking into Australia's largest market, Sydney, has been recognised by Newcastle's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. They described the move as one of initiative and courage, resulting in income benefits, job creation, new technology and a better reputation for the lower hunter. Managing Director of Alco Steel, Glenn Turner, observes that his company's push has yielded important lessons for all hunter businesses. I believe Newcastle uh, has the potential for a very significant decade of expansion in the 90s, not only with relocation and manufacturing activities from the, the south and the west of Sydney into Newcastle, but also the establishment of new businesses, which uh, there are many. Mr Turner says the region has much to offer as a retirement centre for Australia's rapidly growing population, but he says the city must be prepared to make the most of the opportunity. At this stage I'd have to say I think we're we're not doing a very good job of it because we've got far too many bodies that are, uh, represent Newcastle in various areas in terms of seeking new investment and job opportunities in the area. We have to rationalise and, and get those down significantly. The dumping of waste from Tomago aluminium smelter at Wallaroo is a sensitive issue and one that aroused a great deal of controversy. But just when the issue appeared to have died down, it has resurfaced with a vengeance. This time debate centres on the disposal of bags that once contained waste, which has been dumped at Wallaroo. 200 cubic metres of the bags have been buried at the Lemon Tree Passage Tip. Port Stephens Health Surveyor Keith Lindsay says Tomago has approval from the State Pollution Control Commission to dispose of the bags at Lemon Tree. But since the controversy surfaced, he has asked Tomago to defer dumping a further 200 cubic metres of the bags until the issue has been fully discussed by council. Councillor Steve Busted says his phone has been ringing non-stop with complaints from residents who are concerned about the disposal of the bags. 
He says it's an issue that should have been discussed by council and that lemon tree tip is totally unsuitable for disposing waste of this nature. The State Pollution Control Commission inspected the bags that were to be dumped there and came up with a conclusion that they could be dumped in a, into a council dump. However, to my knowledge, they've never inspected the lemon tree dump, which is a quite a problematic dump. It, uh, it's not a line dump, which means that the, any pollution can actually escape into the water table.